while what I have brought to can is canning, then we'll talk about canning. <laughs> it's all canning. It's all canning. <laughs> so today we're going to use the Carry Electric Pressure Canner. This guy is my favorite invention in the world. I'll tell you, if you small batch can, pressure can, this is a dream. If you are a beginner pressure canner and you have all the fears of the explosions and all of that, or if you're a busy canner and can't stand there and watch the pressure all the time, this is what you want. The downside is it is a small batch canner. That's the only downside to the carry is that it is small batch. I'll scream as loud as I can. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to use our carry today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the carry. I can't get it off, but there's a little valve on the top here. If you are less than 1,200 square, less than 1,200 feet above or below, yeah, above sea belt level, if you're below 1,200 feet above sea belt level, you can use the the one that it comes with, the black one. It also comes with a green one that you replace if you're above 1,200 feet above sea level. The lid is detachable, comes off easy for cleaning. It is not dishwasher safe. Your gasket comes out. If you're gonna be storing this in non canning season. Mine never gets stored. I don't have an Instapot. This is my Instapot. So it's versatile. You can brown in it. You can cook a roast in it. A three pound roast will pressure cook in two hours. Now it's actually a little more than that. It's actually closer to two and a half hours by the time it builds up pressure and needs to meet up where it can build pressure if it's frozen pressure can that be then throwing your vegetables for another 10 to 15 depending on the firmness you prefer of your vegetables. What did you say the name of that one? Carrie. C-A-R-E-Y. Nico or Neko, they have bought the patent and they now make it and they also make one with their brand name on it. They're the exact same machine built on the same patent. But that's a pressure canner, not a pressure cooker, right? It's both. Because there are pressure cookers that you cannot can in. Correct. This okay. one is both. Okay. That was like, so, can you can in an instant pot? No. no. It is okay. not recommended. Okay. Yeah. It is not recommended. But some of us are not necessarily do the recommended stuff. We're gonna do a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do a little bit of that today. So the USDA does not recommend canning milk. But we're not gonna can milk. We're gonna can freedom juice. <laughs> so my I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> So my name is Cindy Cargill. My husband Gary and I homestead a small patch in Kansas. We have 11 acres. Um, we tip, on a typical year produce 85 to 90 per, not five percent of our food. That's meat, vegetables, milk, dairy, everything. As much as we forage as well. This year we had a tragedy and was accidentally aerial sprayed, wiped out our 22,000 square feet market garden, oh, lost our herb gardens, uh, almost lost three of our cows. Uh, dairy cows are more susceptible to the herbicides because they're more fragile in their system. And so she spent uh, three days at K-State in the animal hospital to, uh, and praise God, she is uh, four years old. So she's young, she's going to recover and be a productive cow, but it is going to shorten her lifespan, they can't tell us how much. And so um, 
and she is beautiful. She's my baby. My kids are grown, so she's now my baby. You know, your mamas will understand. You know, most ladies get a little black lap dog. I got a 750 pound fairy <laughs> cow. So, freedom gives us right now three and a half to four gallons of milk. We milk her once a day. We calf share with her. So her calf, we milk her in the evening at seven o'clock in the evening. Her calf goes right back. We put her in with her calf. And in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, she goes to pasture. Her calf stays in his pen. And then we pull her 12 hours and milk her. Someone had a question about that? Yes. Freedom is a Jersey milk cow. She's smaller. Um, a lot of folks are going to the mini cows to start out with their beginner. If you are a beginner dairy, want to do beginner dairy, I suggest, and you've never had a, a large animal, I suggest starting with a milk goat. Start with a milk goat. That's going to teach you the basics. You're going to learn, and they're going to not get as sick as fast. I mean, you're going to have to worry about parasites. They're a little less parasite resistant than a dairy cow. But the milk goats, they're going to be a little more easier to handle if you're nervous about handling a large animal. And you're going to learn a lot and you're going to fall in love unless you get an ordinary goat. But typically the dairy goats are very, just like the dairy cattle, they have a nice docile disposition. They're going to be nice. The main thing with a dairy goat is you want to have your billy goat far away as possible or old or not have a billy goat except for breeding time. That is where you get your milk tank tank and you get your smell. The other thing is cleanliness. If you keep everything clean, then you're gonna be fine. Same with your dairy cow, you want to keep everything clean. So I'm gonna get going and as you can some of you that are close can see right here's our milk line and this up here, this yellow stuff up here is the butter fat the cream. I'm going to shake it so that we get it, get cream in our jars. <laughs> so I better get going or I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> this milk is cold. You need a little more head space. Or, yeah. You need a little more space on the top of your jar with your can of milk because it expands so much.
so I typically do not need vinegar. Yes, ma'am. How does the milk taste? Wait. How does the milk taste from Spanish? So the so when we pressure pan it, it is going to taste different. It's going to taste a little more like evaporated milk because the temperature, high temperature, is going to caramelize the sugars in the milk. So therefore, it's going to change the color. It's going to be, instead of such a bright white, it's going to be a little more golden, a little more creamy color. And it is going to caramelize those sugars. And that will change the flavor. You got a cup? <laughs> you have a cup? And since I'm starting out with cold, my water is cold. My water is cold. I don't want to shock my daughters. You might bring more than one back. <laughs> Close my lid and lock it. I'm going to put my vent on exhaust. I'm going to push the pressure cook setting and I'm going to pressure cook for two minutes and I'm going to press start. Okay, so while that's going, we'll talk. You got two minutes. <laughs> no, I don't, it, it, it actually is going to, before it was, that's the wonderful thing about the carry, it will bring everything up to temperature before it starts to feel the pressure. So it's going to be, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before we get even any steam out the top. Yes, sir. I put five pints. It's recommended to only use pints in this or the wide mouth jars. How many of us follow recommendations? <laughs> I obviously do not. <laughs> because I'm, I can milk, but you're not supposed to can, in a canner with, in a small mouth jar. But here's the deal, guys. If our grandmas did it, and if you research and see how they, I encourage you if you're canning, don't do the rebel stuff till you're good and comfortable with canning and you understand what you're doing. I've been canning for over 30 years, if you count, helping my grandma and grandma, my grandma and mother growing up. So we're talking close to 40 plus years of canning. So, and I just started pressure canning milk this year, but with my dairy cow and having so much extra milk, the pigs can only eat so much, even though they really like the milk. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> If you are, if you are canning milk, you do need the pressure, you need it to come up to that 200 plus degrees. Whereas, it's going to be a little more difficult in your hot bath. And you're going to have to really let it go. Like if you hot bath milk, you're going to have to come to a full roll and boil and you're going to have to boil it an hour. So you filter it and then you pressure cook it? I filter the milk whenever, after we milk, I bring the milk into the house, it's in a I have milk and pail and I have a lid for them to come in, filter it through a filter, put it in jars. Typically, I do not immediately can it. You can. That's going to cut some of your time down. But typically, it's 7 o'clock at, actually, it's closer to 8 o'clock in the evening by that time. And I'm not wanting to really can right then. I'm ready to settle down for my day. But um, you can immediately can it. That's going to cut your times down a bit. But for this, we're going to let this run. It's still doing the little thing, dots going around, so it's still heating. We're going to let it run a little bit. We're going to talk about utensils, well, probably. Uh, I'll take a few questions of why do you want the can? Anybody, why do you want a can? I hate going to the grocery store. There you go. Don't eat your own food. It's your own food, yep. Food security. Food security. You know what's in it. You know what's in it. Anybody else? You can't eat my tomatoes all at once. <laughs> Preserving the harvest. There you go. So now we're going to talk about benefits of canning. Preserving the harvest. Security. 
preserving the old ways, preserving what grandmas and great grandmas and, gra and mamas did for some of us. You know, some of us, we're having to learn to can because it got lost in our family or they never learned for whatever reason. So for me, it was, I wanted to be a stay at home mom. And I have food allergies, preservative allergies, more than food allergies. I have allergies to the preservatives and chemicals that are in the food. So therefore, you know what do you do? We always garden. Even when we lived in apartments, our families were on farms. We would farm them when we kids. <laughs> you know, we'd go over and they'd give us a little patch to have our garden. And, and we'd raise our own garden. And Gary's mom was like, Cindy, if you want to stay home, we got ready to have our first and I gave up my career. If you want to stay home, you are going to have to learn to can. You cannot preserve, you're not going to have enough freezer space for all these tomatoes and all these green beans. And so my aunt, who lives across the road from my mother-in-law, wonderful about small communities, she says, I'm too old to can and I will sell you my old canner and you can get started. So I started out with this little yellow canner here. And I don't know how old this thing is because my Aunt Mary canned with it for years. I'm going to guess by the color she bought it in the 70s. <laughs> and I, I call my grandmother constantly because my mother and, and aunts and everybody was working. And mother-in-law. So I call my grandmother constantly. Finally, my grandmother says, you need a book. And she bought one, gave it to my mom. My mom got it to me. This is it. It's been through a bit. Pages are missing. If you look in it, you can see where I made jelly and what jelly I made. So it that was my very first candy book. And I, this is my favorite. I think I will hold on to this thing until it's just completely disintegrated. What's it called? It is the uh, ball of <laughs> this is uh, this is the current one here. Yes. And I have a few extras. This is the current one. The recipes are a little different. So as you can see I have several. If I go to a yard sale and I find a canning book, I'm buying that canning book. If I find an old recipe book and even like the old ones that your the grandma's church put out sometimes it'll have a pickle recipe in it or it will have something from the old days especially the ones that you find in a garage sale that made in grandma's 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 you know so old cookbooks old instruction manuals for presto canners if i find those at yard sales or Goodwill or the Thrifty Nickel, whatever, gotta pick them up. My new favorite is the Ball Complete Guide to Preserving. That's my new favorite. They're pricey. They're 11, if you can find a used one, they're 11 to $30, depending on where you can find one. The trick is right now, finding one. Somebody will find one on Amazon before you have a Yeah, they'll find one on Amazon. So yeah, and then I kind of got all over the place, y'all. <laughs> yes, the different canner. So this one's our pressure canner. This is our old-fashioned Presto canner. This is our hot water bath canner. And yeah, pretty simple. There's a basket in it. You fill it up. You put your jar in it. Not this jar. Why would I not want a canner? <laughs> this is a storage lid. But yeah, you put your jar in, you put your jars in, you're going to fill it up to an inch above the top of your jar. If, it's, if you're doing jelly, you're going to put it in there an inch above. You're going to want that water boiling, you're going to want your jelly to pop. If for some reason your jelly cools down, you're going to want to pull that water down before you put your jar in there so your jar doesn't pop. I feel like I'm all over the place. Instead of just like a nice flow. Oh, he found me a speaker. Hey guys, I don't have the screen match. These are the same. They do the same. 
same job. Different tools do the same job. Found these at Goodwill. Well, this one my mom gave me. Check one, two. There we go. All right, here we go. Is that better, y'all? Yeah. Okay. So this one, my granny called a sin. I don't know if y'all, that's why my granny called it a sin. They did not come, it did not come with a um, little, it's supposed to have a little rounded, little masher, like a, like a pestle. And it didn't have one. It didn't have one. So my buddy, he made me this for my fermenting. Well, it works perfect in my sieve. So for some things, like I'm making tomato juice, some of my jellies that I want to make, hot dogs work better in this because the seeds are bigger. And I can just push it through and push it through and stir it and keep pushing it through to get that pulp out of there. Then the food meal works really good on like apples, things that you've already poured and seeded and it'll separate the peels. It does work really good on tomatoes as well. You're gonna need a big ladle. Preferably stainless steel. This is the one I found and grabbed real quick when I was like, oh man, I need a ladle. You're gonna need a really nice funnel. They have some nice plastic ones in this kit and they're great. Nothing wrong with them. You're gonna need your grabbers. And the rubber gasket part is what you grab your jar with. I was watching a YouTube video the other day, and the gal was, she was struggling. And I thought, and I was going down the comments, and some really sweet grandma had already said, oh, honey, turn that thing over. <laughs> so, so yeah, you've got your grabbers, super nice, that you can get burnt. You've got your lids, which are a hot commodity right now. These are tattlers, which a lot of folks are going to. Tattlers, they are, so they old fashioned. They're kind of old fashioned. Kind of like they go run off of the old fashioned mindset. You got a gasket, a reusable. You got a gasket. You got a lid. They do use a traditional, you know, this ring. You take the ring off and use them. Put the gasket on. You do need to have these in warm water while you're waiting. Now, I do not use boiling water, but I do use warm water when I'm using these so that the gasket keeps up a little bit different. You got a little bit of different type of material in this gasket than you do in the flat. So you put these on your, I don't have an empty, put those on your jar. You put your ring back on the top of it. It's going to work just the same as this, as a regular flat, only you're going to have two pieces to that. You're going to have three pieces to your lid instead of two. Is the white metal, is that glass or metal? It is plastic. They, yeah, they are the BP free or, yeah, BPA, BPA free. So you don't have to worry about that. But it is plastic. I'm a little... I'm a little addicted to that coin, that little pink, little whenever, yeah. These, how you test them, is you you pick up your jar by the, you, or you don't have to pick it up, you can just kind of pull on this a little bit and see if it seal. I have had these unseal on me for prolonged skin. So things that I've had in for a while. Part of that though, I think, was where our, our air conditioning in our house was, we did couldn't control the temperature well in our home and so there was a lot of fluctuation and I think it just was hard on the way. I usually use these mainly now for storage or for short term canning. Something that's gonna be a little while. Something that's gonna be, you know, that I'm gonna have can for two or three years, which a lot of folks are misled by the 18 months. That is not how long that you can keep keep it. That's how long they guarantee the seal. That has nothing to do with what you preserve. It has to do with how long they guarantee your seal. So if you've got the right climate control, you're storing this in a good climate controlled area. It's not a high acidic. Your tomatoes are gonna to be a little more high acidic. They're going to damage that lid eventually. Eventually, 
it's going to take a lot of time. We're talking, you know, five, six years before they start growing that lid. But a lot, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, oh, well, I can only, it's only good for 18 months. we got to use it up. No, honey, that's your, that's your guarantee for your seal. Another safety issue I see. You see my, my jars have rings and look on the lid. And these are canned. That's for transport. When I am storing my canned goods, I do not leave the ring on. Fun fact. If that is ringing on there, the purpose of that seal is to release if it, if pressure builds up or something happens and you didn't get the bacteria killed. Push that, that job of that is to break that seal. It'll be in top. If it doesn't, the jar's going to explode. When I was 13 years old, I stayed this summer with my grandmother, and at that time my granddaddy was still alive. They lived down by down by Houston, Texas, in the heat. My granddaddy made salsa while we were gone to town and had a day trip. And went to town and went to the museum and the park and all kinds of fun things. We came home and he had that kitchen completely cleaned up. Everything was put away. My grandmother was very OCD, and I'm, that is not kidding. She was very OCD. She was pretty excited that he had completely cleaned everything up. She was very concerned that he put the jars away. I like to keep my jars on the counter for a minimum of 24 hours so that I can watch them. Then when I put them away, I'm inspecting my jars at least once a month. I want a visual on as many of my jars as I can to watch for anything in case there was a mistake, in case I made a mistake. You know, in case I did the carry, I don't worry about so bad, but my pressure canner, I worry a little bit more about like, well, did I, did I remember what time I started that? Did it maintain pressure or what, did it fluctuate? You know, because like if it's winter time and the heater kicks on, and even if the air conditioner kicks on, the way my stove is in my house, it's going to affect the flame. You know, blow it a little bit or whatever. So, you want to store those. Long story short, my grandpa put the jars in the spare bedroom closet like he was supposed to do. And then about two weeks later, whenever it was 118 degrees and the air conditioner couldn't keep the house cool, in the middle of the night, we got pepper sprayed. Because that those jars ruptured. And I don't know if y'all know what chili cookies are. They're, they're wild and stuff. Southern Texas, Mexico, there are super hot, teeny tiny little peppers. And he makes his salsa out of it, or made his salsa out of those. And we had to move bedrooms. And then we had to clean that closet with those jars that had exploded because he stored them with the rings on and he had forgot. We didn't know at the time he was early on early onset of Alzheimer's. So he not water bath his jars and so the bacteria started to grow, pressured up, jars exploded because they couldn't release the lid. So that has scarred me for life <laughs> about storing my jars without with the rings on. The other yes ma'am. When you inspect your jars once a month, what are you looking for? I'm looking for air bubbles. I'm looking for bubbles. Is that because it's oil? Yes. That that means it's growing Something that is putting off a gas. Whether that is the vegetables themselves just breaking down because they're going to re release carbon dioxide. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for bubbles. Yes, ma'am. They would go. They wouldn't even go to the hall. They wouldn't even go to the hall. They'd go in the stuff somewhere. Is there any other signs that you've got a bad cat? A white, a white film sometimes on the top. Now that's not going to be true with jellies. That's going to be more like, that's what I'm going to be looking for in my tomatoes and my green beans. A white, a black, or a gray, green, you know, that's what you're going to be looking for in your tomatoes and green beans. So let's see where was I Okay. So storage, I'm still on storage. So storing, I one level layer of jars, I 
do not double stack my jars when they are stored because that's also going to keep that lid from popping if it needs to. Um, that's pretty much the safety on storage. Now I do have a double pressure canner that is that it's green. It's this canner only it's green and it stands this tall. And you can double stack pipe in it. So it has it has two of these. One goes in the bottom. You put the water in there. If you are double stacking, you need to put more water. So you're going to put a couple of inches of water instead of the bottom. Inch. And then you put one down on your first layer of drawers and your second, second layer of drawers. That's going to be fine in your pressure canning. I've got my, when you store your pressure canner, you want to take all of your gaskets out of it. You want to oil them with mineral oil. You're going to have a little rubber stopper at the top. It's going to vary depending. I noticed my friend had an American camera and it looks a little different than mine. But you want to oil those. That is going to protect your gasket. Otherwise, you're going to need to replace your gasket every year. And when you order for Presto, when you order a gasket, they send you a new stopper. And I go ahead and replace that. If I have to get a new gasket, I replace that. These last me around five years because I oil them. If I do a, if I pressure can a lot of tomatoes, high acidic, then I will clean this with soapy water and I will boil it. Just to keep it, I want to keep it limber. I want to keep it, uh, I don't know what, yeah, I want to keep it limber, I guess is what you want to say. But yeah, um, and so then when you rub it with mineral oil, do you wash it off? No. You don't, you just leave it fine? I don't. Okay. I just leave it, it'll soak it up. I did it with mineral oil yesterday, and there's hardly any oil on it now, which tells me since it's been in storage, before I put it back in storage, I need to do it again. If you do think you have too much of a residue on there, you can take a paper towel or a cloth and just wipe it off. Okay. But I wouldn't use soapy water because that's going to pull it out. Okay. And so, I guess, can you hold this a second? When I, when I store my canner, I store it without the lid, without the ring. I, for many years, I stored it upside down because that's what my mother did. And as you can tell, that's what my mother, my aunt did, that's what I did. And so it's taken the paint off. A little more wear and tear. There are little, um, you gotta look. Yeah. If you're blind like me, I can no longer read the open and closed, but I can look for a little, there's a little pedestal here on the rings of this. So that's where I fit with my canner to know that it's open. So now I store it like I should have to begin with, like that. But I don't have the gasket on. Because heat and pressure changes, that can seal. And if they're hard, if you're going to break your handles off trying to get it open, if you ever get it open. We're venting now. I'm going to let that vent for about, about three more minutes and then I'm going to flip it to close and let it pressure up and pop the little stopper up. So I'm going to put this together for you. So basically I'm going to put this, it's got a little stopper thing, put it in the top, get ready to use it, put my gas in. There's a, a nice track that this goes in. It comes in and out super easy. And you can just clean these every time. You don't have to clean them after every canning, but if you want to, it does not hurt it. You just want to make sure you then will spoil it. So we got that. Sometimes they're a little loose when they, like this one has shrunk a bit. I've got it in there. I'm going to pretend I'm canning. I'm going to put it on. There should be a little arrow here that tells me that it's open. I'm, we're going to pretend I got a charge in here and I'm pressure canning. I've got my water, angel water in there. Close it and it's pretty stiff to close. I'm going to do just like this. I'm going to put it on the stove. I'm going to let this heat up. It should already get a little hot if your stuff is hot or cold. Like this, I start with cold water. If my 
green beans are a pot pack. I don't, I'll tell you, I don't pot pack my green beans, but um, I do pressure pan them an extra five minutes. So you're going to put those in, in there. You're going to close your lid down. You're going to turn your heat up. You're going to allow this to vent for five minutes. You want to steam, you want to hear it and see a scream of steam for about five minutes. <laughs> then you're going to put your weight on and you're going to watch your gauge. If your pressure is building too fast, you're going to want to turn it down. You don't want this to build too fast because it's going to be hard on your drawer. Glass is always in a liquid form, even though it doesn't appear that to us. So it can break those bonds if the heat changes too quickly and shatter your drawer. So you're going to let it come up for green beans, 10 pounds of pressure. It's going to, you want it to take at least 20 to 30 minutes to build that pressure. If you see that it's rising a little quicker than that, it's okay to turn your heat down a little bit. You're going to let, I'm going to have about a medium flame or medium setting on my electric to get to that point. Get to the 30, 20 to 30 minutes to build my pressure. And then I'm going to get it stabilized between 10 and 12 pounds of pressure on my gauge. I prefer a gauge, a lot of people use a jiggler. My hearing's not real well, so I don't I don't register a jiggler very well because my hearing is bad. And my granny and my mother always, and my grandmother always use a gauge. So that is what I use. You can go a good resource if you're concerned about your gauge being accurate. A lot of your um, county extension offices, if they don't have a place they can send it off to, they'll have a list of someone that you can take it to and have it checked. And they'll pressure up your gauge and check it. Um, the other thing is, if you've got a buddy with a pressure gauge, there is a way to do it what, through. But, so basically, you take out the stoppers, take out the, the vent, you take the vent off, they put their pressure thing on there that's get it, got a gauge on it and they just check to see if their gauge matches yours and then they calibrate your gauge. So if you've got like a buddy that does a tire shop and knows what he's doing, if he doesn't know what he's doing and it's his first time, you don't want him to do it. But if he's been doing it a while and he knows what he's doing, then and I'll tell you that's what we do. <laughs> we got a guy that knows what he's doing. So to check your, your pressure gauge. When your time is up, so we've got to, to between 12 and 10, and 10 pounds of pressure. For a can of green beans, we're going to let them go 25 minutes. 25 minutes has come off, you check, you keep an eye on this, you've got to babysit it. To make sure you maintain that pressure. Because at any time that you drop below 9 pounds of pressure, you're starting to 25 minutes all over again. So you've got to babysit it. So you get that flame just right or Electric is a little more, it's a little harder because you've got the full heat up and then they can run out the full heat. And so you gotta babysit it. That's why I like my carry. That's why I like my carry. I'm gonna flip that over. It's gonna beat that me in a minute whenever it reaches pressure point. And it's got its interior gauges and everything. This does it, I gotta babysit it. I gotta be on it all the time. And with my ADD, it's very difficult to do because, oh, the laundry needs changed over, or, hey, mom, the cap is out, or whatever. So your explosion concerns are going to be those points. Oh, the cap is out. If the cap is out and you have to leave your canner, turn it off. Just turn it off and walk away and you can start it over. You might have mushy green beans when they're done, but it's more important to get your cap up so you don't get hit on the road. But anyway, beat that me. So our two minutes is going to start now. And what, yeah, you're going to turn that off. Okay, you're going to turn that off. You're going to let it completely pressure down until this gauge says zero. You're going to let this thing set an hour or two. You're not going to touch it. You're going to move it off the stove. You're going to leave it. Because even moving it from one burner to the next, you can knock those jars over, you can drop it and burn yourself, you just leave it. You turn the fire off and you leave it for a couple of hours. Then you're coming back to it, 
you're, you're going to make sure, first off, that this little point, little, there's a little rod in it. You're going to make sure it's down. Make sure this is set to zero. And then you're going to take your weight off first. And you're going to walk away for five to ten minutes. And then you'll come back and you're going to carefully open your thing. And you're going to, if you hear shh, or back on. <laughs> Same thing I didn't even So yeah, we're going to lift it up. And when our guards are going to be hot. We're going to have our countertop protected. And we're going to pull our hot jar off. And I'm set it there. If you, at the point of your canning, see how my ring is flopping? At any point of your canning, if steam is coming out anywhere but there here, or in this middle little part, if you have steam coming out here, you don't have a good seal. Seal. Your gasket got misplaced like that one did, or whatever. You're gonna turn it off. You're gonna walk away from it for an hour if it's been pressuring. You're gonna come back and do our safety measurement of taking the lid off. Because if you try to take that lid off and there's pressure, that lid's gonna shoot sky high. And even our milk, we're going to let our milk sit, even though it's done, it's going to sit a long time. We're not going to vent it, that's going to cause, um, it's going to cause your change, too big of a change of pressure if you vent it, and you're going to lose your lid. And possibly your seal, because particles come out and get sucked from your seal. So you never want to vent it. If you lift this up, lift the weight off, and you hear just a little bit of steam, you just hurry up and put that, put that back on. And you walk away and go do something else. And like, <laughs> They've heard it enough. So that is the safety and basics of canning. And then I'm going to let them sit on the counter and pull down these jars. Listen for my lovely song of point, point, point. I'm And if you're like me, no matter where at you're in the house, you hear those points and you go, okay, that's one down and I got 12 to go. You know, or not really 12, but you know. We got so many more to go. And then I guess we'll talk about water valve can. A water pressure can. Okay. In these books, in these books, in the canning book, you're going to find a table or a section of the book that's going to tell you what needs pressure pan and what can be hot back. I do pretty much stick with that except for probably tomatoes because that changed. Now they want you to pressure can tomatoes and before you can hot back tomatoes. So your big thing with tomatoes is if you put your citric acid in there, if you put your lemon juice in there, if you put your salt in there, so long as you put enough in there, as long as you put a tablespoon per quart, as long as you, of, of, of lemon juice, and I can't remember the citric acid because I don't use it. Is a teaspoon. There'll be a measurement in your recipe books to tell you what to do there. I, or a teaspoon of salt. A teaspoon of salt per quart. And I hot back mine. Or I put them in my carry and do just like I did with the milk. Let them pressure up for a minute or two shut and come down. It depends on my time, what I've got time to do. So you're going to do things like lard. I, I pressure can my lard. You can hot bath lard. Some people hot bath lard. I pressure can my lard. Pressure can it for 90 minutes like it's a meat. Another thing, these little star plants, okra, FDA, or yeah, USDA does not recommend that you can okra by itself. If you add tomatoes with it, onions, celery, you can can it. But by itself, you're not, they say you can't. It, it is one of those things that will change a little bit of color, like it'll get a little darker on the top, but it's not a line that's on there. It's like the darkening because since you pressure it so long, like a meat, it's a 90 minute, it, you do get a little bit of seepage of your fluids. So I do leave it a little extra head space. Do the ball hooks follow the they do. Because my ball book has a recipe for, well, not a recipe, but instructions for canning okra. Is it, is it pickled okra? No. It's, it's by itself. Price off. Is it? I haven't made ball book. Oh, what do you use? What do you use? 
Pickled okra? 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 I think it's great to thicken soups. If you want to thicken your soups naturally, like we put it in vegetable soup. Uh, my granny, my grandmother used to can a gumbo base, so it was a whole lot of spices and I don't know a recipe, but it had a whole lot of spices and celery and carrots and not carrots. I don't remember. Celery and onions and peppers and stuff in it. And she did a gumbo base. So basically it had even her filet and everything in it. And it did have a roux, of course. She made her roux throw it in, bring it up, and then throw in her shrimp. And she did that. I do something similar with just use tomatoes and onions and peppers for like a soup base or it's really good for a chili base. But when I do the peppers and onions in there. But it's a nice thickener if you're trying to avoid corn products. If for some reason, you know, you don't want to use cornstarch. If you're trying to watch your sugar levels, you know, cornstarch is going, it does it is only like it does have a glycemic points so you're gonna have to watch it. Um, and self-sufficiency, I like anything that's going to, I'm not going to have to buy something. What does look like it would be? It sounds like it'd be gross. That's why I would ask Actually, it's not going to be. No, um, it's going to fall apart when you add it. So it's pretty, I've canned it. So you can even see in this jar, it's already started to disintegrate a bit. So you don't even, almost, you don't, you're not going to have very many even whole chunks. And the sliminess is going to thicken. It's going to react. I don't know the chemical stuff, but it's going to react with, what, with especially tomatoes in that soup, and it's going to thicken. And it's not going to be the slimy. Now, if you feel that it is too slimy, back it off. Don't put as much in. Put a couple to it. Yeah. So you can use it for national thickener. I've got a friend. She drains it, rinses it, batters it, and fries it, deep fat fries it like she does her okra instead of freezing it. I think I probably pressure mine too long because it's falling apart by the time a lot of it is by the time I'm done with it. So chicken meats. Got deer here. This is. Um, my chili base for beer, it's already got some of my seasonings and stuff in it. Squash, another one they say you can't can. Um, by itself, you can pickle it, vinegar. This is broth, canned broth, chicken, I've got beef broth, and I've got cabbage that I pressure can, and the milk, of course. And over here, we've got our pickles, jams, and ketchup, or hot bath. Your books are going to tell you what the recipes, whether they be pressure pan or hot bath. And hot bath, and I think we covered this, hot baths you want boiling water and hot. If your stuff isn't hot, then have your water. Uh, browse it. You want your water around the same temperature as what is in your jar, so you don't chop your jar. And then you can always bring that all up on the stove. And then your time counts. Not when your stuff goes in the camera, but when it returns to the wheel. That's when your time starts. You want that at least one inch above the top of your jar from the water bath. Your okay, ten minutes. Okay, I'm gonna have to hurry up and get done so that other folks can set up. Okay. Yes. Can you use your pressure or pot on that? Yeah. You can. So you would you just pretend that it was this. You would you would make sure that you did not put this on. So you would just cover it. I would make just for wear and tear, since you're going to be pulling it off and all, I would make sure the gasket was on. But I would lock it. I would just have it in the same on top. And, um, but you can, especially my double, a double stack. I do a lot of water bath canning in it because I like to do pickles in half gallon jars. I don't have any less, they're all gone. But, so it can, it can hot bath a half gallon jar. But if for some reason I can't hot bath, I can pressure pan those pickles a little. So what I would do if I was doing those pickles, I would set my pressure canner up and only pressure them for three or four minutes. And then, and then lay it all and set it all out and all of that. But yeah, so if you have something, like green beans, you can hot water back in, but it's a long time. It's a long time. You're talking an hour or more. So it's double or triple. I can't really formula anymore. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Bell. 
Yes. And if you don't have access to the raw milk, can you do that? Yes, you can. Same thing. Same thing. Follow the same guideline, same thing, same steps for yeah. pasteurizing. And you're doing 10 for a pint. How much do you do? Oh, I did two minutes. And it, I did two minutes, and for a quarter, I would do two minutes. Typically, two minutes. It really, I just did that for my carrying. The way uh, my mentor had done it is she just brought her, her pressure canner up to 13 pounds of pressure and turned it off. She didn't even let it pressure canner for a couple minutes. Any other questions? Yes, you use the term hot packing. So when do you or don't you do that? Like what, what's the purpose? Or okay, so hot packing is, so like you put your green beans, you snap them, you put them in water, and you boil them on the stove. Like blanching. Like blanching. Like, like blanching. Yeah. Oh, you're going to skim them out and load them in your jar. I don't do that. There's very rarely anything that I hot pack besides my jellies. So I, I typically start with a cold canner and cold jars. Even when you do your green beans, do you like just wait? Do you do it like in parts or do you chill them? So my green beans, I snap my green beans, rinse them, load my jars. Oh, you don't, okay, you don't load my jars. I do put, salt, I put a teaspoon of salt in a quart. I have a kettle or I'll have some hot water on the stove. I will put lukewarm water in my canner, and I don't I don't want that water boiling that's on the stove, but I'll put it in my jars. They're not going to quite be as boiling consistency as they're going to be a little warmer. You can go ahead and start with cold, but you're going to cold start. So you're going to start with a, if you cold start pressure canning, you're going to start with a low heat, and you're, you're going to build that heat up in about two to three minute increments. Go and turn it up a little bit more. You hot back, hot pack. You had a little more time in your prep time. Does that make sense? I think it all works out. It all works on what you like to do. That's the way I prefer to do it. Is to do the cold pack, raw pack, raw pack. You need to raw pack. You put them in. Can be. They can be cooked. It can be even pressure cooked. Cooked meats. So you just fill the jar in with your cold beans. Fill it up with the water, you have your salt in there, and then you put it in the Yeah, I fill it to this little, there's a little rim around here. I fill it to there, put it in my can, bring it up, and put it on, let it eat up a little more, put my, and wait till it's venting good and steaming good so that I make sure that everything in here gets hot. Because I don't want the shock that pressure. If this is, if I put this in here now and just turn it on and let it build pressure, if I could shatter my jar. Right, right, right. The carry is a little more forgiving because it has that internal self thermometer and it's going to, it, it's not going to allow, it's going to regulate that foil to where it's not going to build it either fast. So that's, I like the carry, especially for small batches, quick batches. I recommend it for newer because it's going to be a whole lot different. I, while I am going to leave this, back for another hour to check it to see if it's done. I want it to come down to pressure on its own. Right now it should still have pressure in there. I'm going to come back after the next feature. speakers are done and I'm going to you know, do the same step. I'm going to split that little vent, make sure there's no steam, open it up. I'll pull them out and put them on a cloth on top. And, yeah. But I did miss the step of cleaning the lamp. When you're, can when you're canning, you're going to want to clean those rooms off. Make sure there's nothing on there to that can prevent that seal. And I just use a wet cloth. Have you ever done soup for chicken pot pie filling? Yes. Deer stew, we do a lot of deer stew or chicken pot pie filling. And it's going to be 90 count. It's going to be 90 minutes for a, a pint and about an hour for a quart. So you're going to want your vegetables raw, not going to want to cook them, or they'll be mush by the time it's done. I put my vegetables in raw, I do put my meat in raw, and I put my broth in raw, and bring them. But then I don't, this isn't boiling when I put them in. It is warm water, but it's not good. Yes. Yes. I have not, but that being said, I have 
like my like the mill, what I can mill can that we use the mill. I use those twice, not to pressure can, but like for storage for milk to go in the refrigerator. Like if I took this and, and put it, put fresh, it was all sterilized and clean. I put fresh milk in it, I put the grain and the lid on it, I put it in the refrigerator. A lot of times I'll get it out of the refrigerator and then I see it. Because, you know, the milk comes out of your cow at just over 100 degrees. I think your cow's like 102, I think it's from natural pen. So it comes out pretty warm, warm enough to heat that seal up and then the cold chocolate in the refrigerator to make it form a seal. I wouldn't trust that seal, you know, for a canning purpose. But, and plus I haven't killed any bacteria that could possibly have been in that meal. But, yeah, my mother does. She uses them all the time. I was going to say on the list, my sister ordered $100 worth of lids online and more than half of them, they're so, so thin. If you're not careful about where you get them, they're so, so thin that about half of what she has seen has buckled. Yes. So yes. the lid is actually buckled. The wonderful thing about buying ball or curl lids is if you find a defect, you take a picture of it, and you can file a complaint online. And a lot of times, they will send you a brand new pack. I mean, that's just the wonderful thing about them. Now, you do have to prove that it is their lid, you know, a video or pictures or whatever. This one's ball, yeah. But, I think the lid says ball. Oh, yes, the yeah. lid does say ball over, which I think they're kind of almost thinking about. But anyway, so that is that. I probably can get some. Maybe a little bit of breath over whatever you're trying to do. And it's halfway to the ball, but I have a I don't know. Can you repeat the question? She asked if my jar was only half full, would I go ahead and can that? I would not. That's too much air space. Um, I'm not sure if there's any. That, if you have leftover. Yeah, I, well, if I have leftover, usually I, I put it in the refrigerator and I can something like that similar. Or I put it in the freezer. Like if it's chicken. I put it in the freezer or I put it in the refrigerator so I can make a chicken salad out of it or sandwich. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Someone. Yeah. Someone yeah. makes something out of it. Too much air space is not good. Yeah, too much air space is not good. Now, things like the lard, the meats, the milk, high protein, they're going to expand quite a bit. So you do want to use, leave more what they call head space. See, like this jar. For whatever reason, I didn't get it packed good, and so therefore I didn't end up having enough liquid in it. And so I did miss something. Whenever you put your green beans in, you're going to want to run around. They have a measure in here, so measure stick. You're going to run and around the all fair bottle. That's the only thing. It's a large top. The large is a hot pack. But with the lard, it's going to be so hot, I do want my water boiling in my pan so that I don't have to talk too much when I put it in there. And I'm going to actually use a little bit of caution with the lard. If I'm putting the lard in, I'm also going to have my three hands. I'm going to have it with a bit on and another bit on for a hot pan. So that just in, just in case something taps on and I think I need to stabilize that jar a little more, I'm going to have that bit on for the Yes, ma'am. You were talking about mixing Yes. I already had like celery and different vegetables in it, so I just on a whim added cream of chicken. Yes. Are there recipes to make cream of chicken? There is, but the recipes like for like when I, if I make a cream of or something that's going to be cream of, I don't put the milk in it, the milk or the thickener in it. So I just can like the chicken and then I will make the cream. Cream of anything is super easy. Cream of anything is okay, go ahead and cook your mushrooms, a little bit of chicken broth or beef broth, whatever you want. And then you put a little bit of milk in it and put a little bit of cornstarch or flour. And there is, if you can't do corn, you can't do wheat, then you put it, um, arrowroot. And then there is your cream of chicken. Um, I don't, for my jellies, I don't have to use, I do not, but I don't eat many jellies because I have blood sugar issues as 
well. So I'd be careful about pouring it tight. I've used two apples first because it has natural fat. Yes, yes. And I think I've got to shut down. I think we'll put it ready for a minute. Well, so I can't, I have not canned butter yet, but that is on my list. Yes, it, um, typically that's if, if it's salted. If it was salted butter, yeah, if you didn't have to have it in that salt in it, that's typically what makes the butter grain when you reheat it. Even when you reheat it on the stove, it'll make it grow. I think it tastes the same. My friends tasted the same. Thank you guys so much.